So we're going to move forward. And as we continue to shape this context of how we got to this moment, we obviously have to talk just a little bit about um, the importance of the backlash that emerged as a result of the election of the, the nation's first black president. Um, and for classroom purposes, obviously, the, 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 the language of backlash uh, we often associate with two major eras of reform, racial reform in particular, America's first reconstruction after um, the Civil War, and then uh, uh, the uh, experiences of uh, folks and, and, and policy uh, challenges after the civil rights era of the 1950s and 60s, oftentimes referred to, referred to as a, our nation's second reconstruction. Um, let, let's Rob. be clear, we are in a, a moment where we feel very much like and are indeed in the throes of another civil war. And so we want to be honest about that and we want to talk about that a little bit. But folks, jump in, in, in here and let's, let's go back to the moment of Barack Obama and let's, uh, let's revisit so, that time. Rob, if you don't mind, I just want to quickly jump in before I have to jump off sure. um, and talk about that. Um, and so I am one of the many millions of people who was a staffer um, on the Obama campaigns. And, um, and so, you know, I'm not going to go into all the, 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 there was a lot of great things that happened during that, but also, um, there was a lot of, a great deal of missed opportunity. And I think the biggest problem with, um, President Obama and his administration was that number one, um, he was, um, a cautious pragmatist um, as opposed to a revolutionary pragmatist. And I think, I know that sounds like a contradiction in terms, but you can be pragmatic, but also revolutionary and moving forward in an agenda. Um, and I think he was not those things. And, um, and then two, um, the president, um, with all due respect, and you know, I still admire and you know, was, you know, one of the, the great joys of my life to work on those campaigns, um, despite the, the difficulty of them, because they were incredibly difficult. Um, and that's another discussion you all can talk about, toxicity and, and movement organizing maybe one day. But um, all that being the case, um, the president um, and all the great things that he did um, was hampered, is hampered still by respectability politics. Um, you know, to be frank, like he had to basically be the, the quote unquote perfect version of a white person's black man in order to get to that point. Um, and even still um, was hated and despised. His family had the most death threats in the history of presidents and their protection regimes and all that stuff. Um, and so, you know, it's kind of one of those things of, you know, um, we've got the door open now but when I go in the room, we got to clean up everything before we can even walk into the sucker. And I think, you know, to be honest, and I think it's incredibly important that Obama was able to walk into that room. Um, but yet and still, he was hampered by white supremacy. He was hampered by, um, you know, the respectability politics that told him that he needed to be a certain kind of black man in order for white people to accept him and also not be viewed as an angry black man or a threat to um the sensibilities of white america um even the ones who were progressive um white folks who supported him there's only a certain limit that um to be frank in my experience that white people will go um and that limit is usually when it starts to threaten their own livelihood and security or what they think is their livelihood and security um relative to someone else and so um you know, obviously, I like I said, I admired Barack Obama, President Barack Obama, a great deal. I think he was infinitely better than who's there now. Um, I think during the Great Recession, you know, there was a lot of missed opportunity. Um, but, you know, to be frank, they saved the economy. There's no two ways about that. But, um, you know, just like this crisis now, um, it was necessary for them to, um, see that and take advantage of it. And I think they failed in that. And so I want to thank you all for giving me the time to be here and uh, take care. I look forward to the recording.
Thanks, Jerry. We appreciate your time, brother. Can, can I jump in on this, on, on this discussion? Go ahead, because, well. um, You know, I think Obama is a great way of getting to the real issue that I think we, we should be talking about because police violence against black people was taking place during the Obama administration. I mean, a lot of the names that we posted on the chat, those happen on Obama's watch, so to speak, right? And I'm not, you know, I, I would have voted for a third term, don't get me wrong. But the, the white supremacy has no better acolyte than law enforcement and police violence. Because we could talk about the racism of Trump and we can talk about the, the, the success and failure of the Obama administration all we want, but the middle term that unites those that I'm hearing from protesters today, last night, is police violence against black people is out of control. It's been out of control. And so, you know, we could, we, we could, we can move into the backlash direction, I think, but, but really it's, it's that issue that remains, you know, coming back to, to all the way to the discussion that Fred uh, put forward talking about slavery and slave patrols and fugitive slave law, right? The second chapter of Black Reconstruction, W.E.B. Du Bois explains how the institution of slavery in the United States depended entirely on poor white populations in the South. That population became a watchdog. It, it became an overseer. It, it became the police force that effectively served and protected the institution of slavery. That's why we didn't see slave revolt in the United States the way we did in Haiti, argues Du Bois. Until this day, police violence against Blacks remains the, the, the central premise that unites what we're, what we're witnessing in the United States, what we've been witnessing in the United States, th this social order predicated on, on injustice, right? And so we have an unjust law and white supremacist order. That's what we continue to see. Come on in, Fred. Thank you for the opportunity. And I think for all the uh, scholars out there that, that want to have a subject uh, matter to teach on this, this would be the perfect one to compare between uh, the Trump administration and the Obama administration because yes, while there were individuals that were being summarily executed by law enforcement under the Obama administration, in May of 2015, he had completed the task force on 21st century policing. He had put millions of dollars in community-oriented policing under the Department of Justice, which is a theory under which uh, police law enforcement goes from a warrior mentality to a guardian mentality. And the guardian mentality looks at the criminogenic behavior of individuals that are committing crimes and looks for solutions versus ticketing, fining, and arresting. So absolutely, uh, there were individuals that were being summarily executed by law enforcement under the Obama administration, but let's not miss the point that he had done something about it. And that gets lost too often, that when Jeff Sessions came in, he totally dismantled the community-oriented policing department within the Department of Justice, and they went back to the a uh, warrior model when you heard the president said to the uh, fraternal order of police officers convention in florida when you arrest the thugs bump their head in the car rough them up a little bit so, so i think that is one way you can teach how we got to where we are today and the attempts that have been going on to try and correct this so we 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 want to um be as respectful of your time as possible today folks and of course we know how important trayvon martin and the black lives matter movement uh, has been to uh, our current communities of protesters and demonstrators and so we don't want to ignore that we don't want to uh, uh, miss the opportunity to discuss that there is one particular article that I think is very useful in this moment. It's titled, 
Fear of a Black President by Tenaisi Coates, which talks mm -hmm. about Obama and the Trayvon Martin scenario and the question of respectability politics and all of these particular components. So for those of us who want to dig into some of those topics with a bit more detail, uh, I would highly recommend that, that article, and I'll put it in the chat. It's from The Atlantic, uh, but it gets into some of the themes around Obama, Martin, Martin's murder and, and, and some of the related topics. But we want to keep moving as we, we need to uh, get, get close to a wrap up. Will, uh, there's no better lead in than this particular, to this particular slide than uh, Fred and Grant's Thanks, last you. comments. Talk about war, the war on crime as a bipartisan project. No doubt, and I'll keep this brief so we can kind of wrap this up and have a little conversation after. But I think Fred's point is a good one. And it extends to sort of a critique I want to make about policing writ large. Um, because we have to remember that George Floyd died in Minneapolis, and the Minneapolis Police Department, long considered one of the most progressive police departments in the country, fully took in that 21st century policing task force, and yet we still, we still see this devastating um, murder at the hands of the police. So I think it's complicated, and I certainly agree that you know, the Obama administration took a much more proactive approach, but let's talk about the war on crime that gets us here in the first place. That's, there's so much of this that's at the heart of the issues we're seeing in America right now. Um, and the points I wanna make more than anything is just that our war on crime, it, it doesn't have to be, right? If we had, and I'm gonna extend this back to the 1960s, if we had continued Lyndon Johnson's war on poverty, expanded it, given more power to black community organizations, brown community organizations at the local level and vigorously invested in their economic opportunity and development as initially intended, we'd be in a much different place today. And that's the central argument that something called the Kerner Commission in 1968 um, levied um, when the government asked this group of basically political liberals to respond to all of the uprisings in the 1960s to get at the cause of them, to get at the roots of them. And they responded by saying, hey, these communities are isolated. We have a real you know, racism problem. There's um, segregation that's hemming them into these um, neighborhoods that are not receiving the same equal share of money and benefits and aid. And guess what happened? Well, the Johnson administration put that study to the side, they tabled it, and they invested vigorously vigorously in policing and punishment. That's the war on crime. And that started in 1965 after the Watts uprising, closely trailing the Harlem uprising in 1964 and hundreds more in the mid 1960s, especially in Milwaukee, keep this local in 1967, but also in the aftermath of Dr. King's assassination in 1968. And since that time, folks, we've been investing so many dollars into our war on crime effort, punishment, policing, prisons, incarceration, at the expense of economic development and investing in people's lives in a meaningful way in non-punitive solutions. And that's why I'm just gonna leave you here quickly and say abolish the police, abolish the police. That might be controversial, but we can have a discussion about it. Some of you all might disagree with that statement, but I think the conversation needs to be had. Is policing fundamentally equipped to answer the problems of today in our society? I would argue no, and we're seeing that in a big way. You can add to that. You know, people talk about, I think that's heading in, in the right direction. Because you could talk about, for instance, like um, people like to talk about the poverty draft, right? And the way in which working class right. and poor individuals are lured into the military, you know, under the promises of a, of a paycheck or a green card or something like that. I want to ask, what are the social conditions that lead one to become a cop? You know, <laughs> what, what, how are non-white and white people lured into law enforcement? Some of my own family members, right? Because of the salary augmented with overtime pay, it's not bad, right? I mean, yeah. someone said 47% of our budget in Milwaukee goes to law enforcement, right? What are the, I would describe them as psychological pathologies that a person needs to have in order to be a police officer in the world that we live in today with the economic and racial inequality that we have today, right? We have to start asking questions like that. What, what, what are the social, social economic conditions that are at the back of policing in the United States? 
If we can start asking those questions, I think we can start getting at some of these issues that, that I think are at the back of the sort of abolish, abolish law enforcement, abolish police. That's right. The same goes for prisons as well and prison workers. These are, these are fairly well high paying jobs that offer something of opportunity to folks who are feeling uh, left out socially and economically in both rural America and in urban America. So that's a really great point. Fred, I, mean, I, gotta, I gotta come back to you, Fred. You sit, uh, you sit really close to this. You, you're right in the middle of all of this. You've seen police militarization. You've seen the massive amounts of dollars funneled to, to local law enforcement. What, what kind of thoughts you have for us? Yeah, I don't, I'm, not, I'm not one that is uh, pro-elimination uh, of law enforcement. I think there's a need for it. There's some people out here that just uh, have malice in their heart. Uh, there's a need for some type of uh, penal system. I don't think the current one that we have, it does not uh, deter punishment. It does not rehabilitate. And it's certainly, all it is is punitive. Um, there are other models in other countries that have been proven to work better. But what I will agree want on is that the Kerner Commission, uh, the uh, 21st Century Task Force on Policing, the 414 Violence Prevention uh, uh, study that was done here from the Office of Violence Prevention all highlight poverty as being the root cause to many of the societal issues that police have to deal with. And until we address that, we're still going to have people uh, exhibiting criminogenic behavior. So that's where the emphasis should be placed. Uh, we know that we often talk about voting rights and how voting rights are constantly being eroded, but we seldom talk about civil rights and how they were never fully implemented, how they were never fully engaged and they're on the books now, they're not being implemented and or enforced the way they are written, which give inf uh, individuals with uh, low socioeconomic uh, status the ability for upward uh, income mobility. And, and that, that's part of where the fight needs to be. And one other thing I just want to uh, highlight is that what we see in this current condition of civil unrest is the blend of both uh, racist and uh, age groups, which I think is a good start. Absolutely. Absolutely, folks. Listen, we want to, we, we can't cover it all today. We tried to cover as much of it as we could. We hope that in the uh, last hour, hour and 15 minutes, we've given you three or four great chunks of uh, ideas to play with. Uh, we can come back around and have some more of these conversations. This is a developing scenario, but we certainly want to end today with uh, some information about resources that are useful, not only in this moment, but subsequently. Uh, we have information here from the ACLU for Know Your Rights. Uh, young people should certainly know these, particularly in this, in this moment. Um, and thereafter, uh, you, you will also see as we move through the slide here, and we'll make this available for everybody, you'll see other sources for learning materials uh, in subsequent slides, we can move forward. Uh, yep, uh, we've got uh, resources here that are very valuable and very effective in not only teaching these very tough topics, but some of the related uh, topics that emerge uh, in and around these conversations. Um, I think it's really important for us to remind everybody that a number of the cultural museums have also provided a number of online resources across the country. Uh, let's not forget about what's out there already. Um, I think we have one more slide for us. And uh, there's, there's important uh, materials here regarding bystander intervention and the like. And so we'll make sure that these resources are available for folks. Uh, this is a, a very trying moment and we need not only all hands on deck, all info and all knowledge on deck as well. Let me just take one quick moment. Yeah, go ahead. If I could just say one quick thing, because I just want to clarify, you know, I often ask my students to imagine 
police and law enforcement divorced from the role it plays in supporting white supremacy? You know, what, what would law enforcement look like if it wasn't a conduit that does, you know, that doesn't promote black violence, violence against black bodies, right? What would policing look like there? And I often tell my students, how do we call those cops? You know, so I wouldn't be against law enforcement if it can be separated from the sort of ideological position that it has relative to a white supremacist social order. But we have yet to really think about that. I, I hear that argument, but then we're, we, we miss a little bit of the class dynamic because we've had policing where it's predominantly white European bodies being policed in this country. And it was just as repressive, particularly in the context of working class upright or working class labor actions and strikes. I mean, I, I would push and say there is something fundamental to policing in this country. I know that European models offer something different as well, but I think there are consistencies through there. We got, we got to think more on this too. I think, I think the tie between race and class is so, so critical here. Well, folks, we're going to thank our, please join me in thanking our panelists, Fred, Jared, Will, Grant, Ben, Lisa, and uh, Keisha in the background. We've got some more uh, events coming up. I'm going to stop our live stream on Facebook right now and we'll hang out for another few minutes and, and finish up with some of our conversations. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, we'll, we'll go backstage, if you will, and have some, some more conversations for a few minutes.